Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you for this uh, this beautiful day. We thank you for the chance to uh, just praise your name, even though we're not together uh, in the church building. We just thank you for this time that we can uh, praise your name and be in your word. Um, thank you for the, the elders and the deacons of this church that are uh, deciding how we worship and, and when we worship. We just thank you for their guidance, and we know they look to you for strength. Um, Help us as we go out this week. Help us to just be light shining for Jesus. And we thank you for, for everything that Jesus has done for us and him dying on the cross. Uh, help us as we go out this week. Help us to uh, just be with you. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Weatherford Church of Christ. I hope your Sunday morning is going well already today. Let me remind you that on Wednesday, we started reading through the Bible together as a church family. Not a cover-to-cover -cover reading through the Bible, but a chronological reading through the Bible. If you grab one of the bookmarks that's here at our building or check our Facebook page each day, you will see uh, the readings that are for that day, and it will arrange the content of Scripture in a way that kind of moves along the timeline. Uh, there will be parts that are set next to each other because they were happening at approximately the same time in history, and maybe will allow you to see the story as it unfolds a little bit more clearly. We're doing this as a kind of a seasonal thing here in 2021 because we want this year to be a year where we are more focused, more intentionally uh, engaging in, in the Word of God to be taught and to be shaped and transformed by the Word of God uh, so that we can walk more clearly in the kingdom of Jesus. And so I invite you to join us on that. Now, if reading five chapters a day is just too much, you don't have the time for that, you don't have the attention span for that, whatever the case may be, that's okay. Uh, the win is not keeping up. The win is just engaging in the process. I would love to hear stories about you getting hung up on a chapter and you just are chewing on it for days and days and days because of the ideas that are in that chapter. And I'd love to hear the stories about how you got ahead of the reading schedule and finished before everybody else. All of that is good. Uh, it's all about the practice of being in the Word of God with each other. And so just again, encourage you to do that. Check our Facebook page each day to find out what the readings are for that day or grab the, uh, the bookmarks that we have here in our building. Before we dive in uh, to Scripture this morning, if you would please join me in a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for today and thankful that even though we're not all here together, uh, we are able to spend this time together in your word, that we are able to spend this time together thinking about you, setting aside this part of our day uh, to be focused in on you. Lord, we desire to be transformed. We desire to be changed. We want to look more like Jesus in this world. We want to understand what it is that we are being called to live into. And so as we talk about these things this morning, I pray that you would help our imaginations to wake up and to be transformed to, to think about things the way you do, to see things the way you do, to value things the way that you do. Lord, we love you. We are so blessed to be your children. Thank you for that gift of love that you've given us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 65. We're going to be there in just a moment. We started this series a couple of weeks ago talking about where things started. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and we began to unpack this idea that God intended for the heavens, His space, and the earth, our space, to be intimately joined together. We see pictures in those first chapters of Genesis of humans and God walking together, uh, communing together, having a very close relationship with each other. And then we talked last week about what went wrong and what was lost there in Genesis chapter 3 as Adam and Eve chose to do things their own way, uh, not, sub not submitting to, surrendering to the will of God. And we saw that what was lost wasn't just communication. I mean, God still communicated with them and with their offspring. But what was lost was that close connection, that intimate connection between the heavens, God's space, and the earth, our space. Today, we're going to talk about where things are headed. What's the end of all of this going to be like? And that way will allow us next week to talk about kind of what do we do right now while we're in between the beginning and the end. So today is about where are things headed. This is a big question that the Israelites asked regularly. We see throughout the Psalms, they pray things like, How long, O Lord, will things stay like they are? When will you remember the promises that you made to our forefathers? They had promises from Yahweh about His plans for them. And yet there were big chunks of time in Israel's history where those plans seemed to be stalled out or even completely forgotten. 
They had the tabernacle and the temple to remind them that the heavens and earth were supposed to be together. Both uh, the t- temple and the tabernacle were, de- were decorated in ways that, that were supposed to be built on the imagery of Genesis 1 and 2, the Garden of Eden, heavens and earth together. But they also, the Israelites also remembered how their unfaithfulness and the unfaithfulness of humanity in general had wrecked all of that. They could easily see the fallout of the sin that was all around them, even in themselves. We see this in places like Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 through 3, where Isaiah writes, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. And then again, skipping ahead to Isaiah chapter 65, first three verses of this chapter, we see another uh, indictment. This time, the words of God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. We read this, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. All day long, I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, a people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick. At this point in Isaiah, some exiles had come home from Babylon, but what they found was the ruins of Israel around them. And some Israelites were still off in a far-off land. But these were not the first people to experience exile. No, the exile of Israel only echoed the exile that Adam and Eve experienced in the beginning when they were exiled from the garden. Just like Adam and Eve, Israel ended up living in exile from a close relationship with God and the promises that he had made to them. Now, in the midst of this exile, and eventually, in the less than ideal return from from exile, where, again, they saw ruined Jerusalem and ruined walls and even the temple in ruins, some Israelites began to imagining something better. And their imagination went wild. They were imagining a full-scale renewal and restoration of what were the defining characteristics of God's very good creation in Genesis 1 and 2. These prophets, inspired by God, began imagining the things that the tabernacle and the temple had pointed to. God's space, the heavens, and our space, the earth, not just loosely connected through these holy hot spots, but the heavens and earth together, intimately joined again as they were in the beginning. Now, let's read together in Isaiah chapter 65, beginning in verse 17. Again, the words of God spoken through Isaiah. God tells us, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem. And take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. Or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them. Or plant and others eat. For as, the, for as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. Isaiah, given this vision by God, begins to imagine the new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered 
anymore. The ways of life they were experiencing right then, they will not be remembered anymore. Jerusalem and its people will be a delight. He says the sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in Jerusalem no more. There will be provision for everyone, long life and good health, dwelling spaces, plenty of food, productive labor. And if we read carefully, we can see that as Isaiah is thinking about the new heavens and the new earth in the future, he is also remembering the way it was created to be in Eden. That very last verse, verse 25, again reads, The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. This is all a reference to the way Eden was. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So let me ask you this here in the middle of this sermon. What is your imagination for what blessing looks like? When you imagine what a life that is full of God's goodness, what is it that you picture? Does it look like what God made in the beginning? Does it look like what God was revealing to these Israelite prophets? What we find in the New Testament is that Jesus' first followers pick up where the prophets have just left off. And now with Jesus in their heart and mind, as they've lived life with him, as they are meditating on his actions and his words, they also envision what Jesus was pointing to in his life. Remember, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven has come near, repent and believe the good news. And his first followers took him seriously. They believed that in him, the heavens and the earth were no longer held apart, but that intimate relationship was beginning again. This new creation was coming about in the person of Jesus. And so if you turn to Revelation chapter 21, the very last chapter or two of the entire Bible, we see what one of these first followers of Jesus was given by God to, as a picture of what is coming. We're going to start here in chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. John writes these words given by God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Did you hear that? John who had lived alongside Jesus who had watched his life, who had listened to his teachings, who had seen him die and come back in resurrection power from the grave. John was also familiar with the writings of Isaiah, and he has given an even more robust vision of what Isaiah had begun imagining hundreds of years before. John uses some similar language. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Again, images of what the tabernacle and the temple were pointing to. And interestingly, lots of things were missing from new creation. But it was all the bad stuff. It was all the old order of things. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. But the vision continues. Look down in verse 22 of chapter 21. John continues, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful 
but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. In this last passage, we begin seeing that there is no temple. There isn't a need for a holy hot spot because God is now dwelling among the people. They are in the middle of what the Old Testament people knew as the holy of holies. And if there's no more temple, we also see something else being made new. Eden is being restored. We are shown that as we move forward with Christ, We are heading towards the new beginning. The heavens and earth being God's temple. God and Jesus' light lighting up the place. They're walking with people from all nations who are there. There's the tree of life and humans reigning with God as they were created to do from the beginning. This is what God reveals. Remember, this is the revelation. He is revealing this to us. This is what God reveals to His people about His plan. His original intent, the heavens and earth being together, intimate communion with His people, abundant provision and collaborative purpose for and with His people, that's still what He's working towards. So why are we invited to imagine a different future? Why would we ever be told we can imagine something different from what we are experiencing in this world right now? You know, interestingly to me, as Christians, we are not called to go back to the good old days. That is not the call that Jesus puts in our life. We are called to live forward to the good old days. You'll hear parents parents say that they want things to be better for their kids than it was for them. For generations now, that's been a line that American parents have said, I want for things to be better for my children than they were for me. And that's great and frustrating. For every good thing that we grasp and hold tightly to and think, this is part of what I want to give to my children. We watch 10 other things spin out of our control. We see a hundred of other things going in directions. We think, that's not what I want for my children. We have to admit that we can't reconstruct this past, this glorified past, and put it together and hand it to our children. And Jesus doesn't ask us to. Jesus invites us to imagine a different future for our kids and for our families, for our neighbors, for our enemies, for our world, and yes, even for ourselves. It is a future that God has never stopped working towards. It's what he started in Eden, yes, and it is what he will complete in the renewed and restored heavens and earth together, what John was writing about in Revelation 21 and 22. So let me ask the question I asked you earlier again. When you imagine a blessed life, what do you imagine? When you imagine a life full of the goodness of God, what do you imagine? If you're like me, there are times that my imagination needs transformation. Just this week, as thinking about and thinking about this sermon, an idea hit me that I, I just was frankly uncomfortable with. I had to deal with the idea that maybe my dreams of a blessed life are more influenced by television commercials than they are by scripture and prayer. When somebody were to, if somebody were to ask me, Aaron, what is your picture of the good life? What is your picture of a blessed life full of the goodness of God? Oftentimes, it's the stories I'm told by television commercials that enter my mind first. And I have to re, I think, think really hard about what is it that God might imagine for me. Does your imagination look like what God made in the beginning? Do you imagine the good life being what God revealed to these Israelite prophets? Do you imagine the good life, the blessed life, the full of God life being what God revealed to John in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus? 
Can you even imagine a place where there are no more tears, no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain? You know, we often talk about what we're saved from. Saved from sin, saved from mistakes, saved from darkness, saved from death, yes. But this is what we are saved for. A life free of those things and full of the goodness and love and glory of God. Not my glory, His glory. Remember the old order of things, this stuff we're living in now, that stuff is what passes away. And the things that God intended in the beginning and is still working towards now, those are the things that we are going to experience in eternity with Him. So how do we respond to this today? Well, honestly, this is why we're reading through the Bible over this next few months. Because it's in Scripture that our imaginations find something to hold on to and say, yes, I want to move in that direction. It's in reading the Scriptures and letting those pictures and images fill our minds where we get less and less influenced by the TV commercials and more and more influenced by what God is wanting to do in you and in me and all around us. We can pray for a renewed mind. Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Not just His good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life, but His good, pleasing, and perfect will for the entire world. This is what can begin to fire our imaginations for what God is doing. As we watch Jesus, we can begin to imagine through His mind, through His eyes, through His ears. Remember, He is the one who could see things that were possible where others could only see the impossible. This is why His enemies ask questions like, why does your teacher eat with sinners? It's because Jesus didn't see them just as sinners. He saw them as people who had missed out on the good things of God and He saw new things possible for them. It's why he says, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. He's challenging us and encouraging us to have an imagination that sees him in the people around us. It's why Jesus can seriously tell us that it's blessed to be poor in spirit, blessed to be mournful, blessed to be meek, blessed to be merciful and pure in heart, blessed to be peacemakers, and yes, even blessed to be persecuted. Take some imagination to see that. We need to spend time in the Word and in prayer with Christ to have our imaginations transformed to be like His. It's also why every week we do what we're about to do together. To sit around the Lord's table, to eat the cracker, to drink the juice that remind us of His body and His blood, His life and His sacrifice. This is a great time for imagination transformation. So as we head into that time here in just a couple of moments, I want to ask you two more questions. In the imagination transformation you're going through, what reality are you living from? Is it the reality that God started in the beginning, that as we read Genesis 1 and 2 and we see what God intended, we can understand better the way God desires things to work? And what reality are you living towards? Because when we read Revelation 21 and 22, we can see where this thing is going. Does my life right now look like a life that is informed by the reality that God wants me to live from and the reality that God wants me to live towards? What about your life? What reality are you living from? What reality are you living towards? As we prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like to you to, for you to consider something with me. Uh, Jesus' last act with all of his disciples there before he was ultimately beaten, arrested, beaten, crucified, uh, was to sit around a table with them and share a meal. We know this as the Last Supper recorded in the first three Gospels. We remember this each Sunday as we take communion or the Lord's Supper together. And one of the great focuses of this time on a regular basis is just the togetherness of it all. We have the opportunity as God's family, as brothers and sisters, to gather around a figurative table and break bread and drink juice together to remember his body and his blood. 
And as we think back to that time that is recorded in Matthew and Mark and Luke, when Jesus is sitting at that table, um, that was the last time they were all together before his resurrection. And even though he eventually left his followers, he promised that he would remain with them through his spirit. And so today, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper once again, like we've done many times throughout the last year in our homes, with our families, not together as a larger body, I hope you'll remember that while we do take this together figuratively, we always take this together with Jesus in our midst. We remember his body that was beaten. We remember the blood that was shed on our behalf. And even though everything would be so much better if he were right here with us, we have the promise of his presence, which I've always said is perhaps the greatest promise he gives us. He is with us, whether you are in your car, in your home, uh, wherever you are right now, he is with you. And we are together, even though we may not be in the same room physically, we are together with brothers and sisters all around the world as we uh, take the Lord's Supper this morning. I'll lead us in a prayer for uh, the bread and the cup, and you can take those on your own after we finish. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gift it is to be able to gather uh, so often with our family, with your family. And Father, uh, today as we are once again dealing with being apart, we're thankful for the bond that we share through you and through your son. And we're thankful that we have avenues like this to join together in worship and in praise. But Father, as we are spread out around uh, our towns and communities right now and doing this virtually, we know that you are still with us. And we know that uh, together or separate, we have the same things to be thankful for. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son, for your love that was willing to give him up for us, for his love, which was willing to pay the ultimate price for us. We're thankful for his body that was given for us, his blood that was shed, and for the hope that we have through his sacrifice and through your power. And we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Hey, church family, please bow with me for the closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. As we go throughout this Valentine's Day, help us to be mindful of the love that you've shared. And may we rejoice in that love, dear Lord. As we continue on throughout this week, wherever we may be, dear Lord, let us share the love that you've shared with us with others. May we be a light for you, dear Lord. Please continue to be with those who are sick and are hurting. Guide and direct us each and every day. May we all each follow you, dear Lord. And it's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Hope y'all are warm and safe in your homes and don't have to get out in this snowstorm. As Steve mentioned last week, we're gonna start back our Sunday school on March 7th. The Education Committee has been getting together with teachers, been working on curriculum for the younger kids to have Bible class. The Aaron and others have been working on the curriculum for Sunday morning, and we're gonna kick that off on March 7th. We're also very excited to be reading through the Bible again this year, as Aaron spoke of earlier. We think it's very important for a disciple of Christ to be in his word. We also think it's very important for you to be part of a bigger community and see how his word is affecting other people as well. We encourage you to be here when Sunday school starts back up for you to learn more about God's word and for you also to encourage others. So we look forward to getting back together in Sunday school on March 7th. Be safe out there and be warm. Have a good day.